Good morning and welcome to the Gibbs Flash Forum. It's a true pleasure for me to be in conversation with uh, somebody I've met earlier this year and somebody I'm hoping that will develop into a great professional relationship. And then in time, hopefully what we might call a friendship. I know that today we're beginning early, so we're gonna start off in an intimate session, but many of you will have an opportunity to review this and share it with your colleagues as we post this on our YouTube platform. So I know that this will grow in its influence because that we're having a really important conversation today. And I also encourage you to post your questions on the Q and A chat because we want you to be part of the conversation. It's not supposed to be merely a two way conversation. So today we are continuing a conversation as opposed to starting a conversation. We're continuing a conversation that was hosted on, on, on Business Day TV uh, by Jeremy Maggs, a very respected TV journalist, uh, which was held together with um, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town, Professor Mamukheti, with um, leading business uh, figures like um, Martin Kingston, as well as, and Vugani will remind me, the CEO of the JSE, and of course, today, uh, Leila Fouri, the CEO of the JSE, and today we are in conversation one on one with Vugani Mati. Vugani is the chief executive of Accenture Africa, an organization he joined way back in 2000, uh, as it was emerging out of what would soon become the defunct Anderson uh, business. It previously was Anderson Consulting and then evolved into Accenture. And he did this at a time when the consulting group was in a deep conversation um, with the auditing profession. It's very interesting that more than 20 years later, this conversation of auditing and consulting still continues. And we've seen some of our colleagues in this industry, the likes of PwC, the likes of Deloitte, and of course, the likes of KPMG, they've struggled with maintaining those two in a single business model. Of course, some of you might think, well, you've stayed in one company all this time. In order for him to remain relevant and to be taken seriously into the future, Vugani did leave Accenture for a short while. I'm sure you'll tell us about that and explored his entrepreneurial in initiatives. But he later came back, was given much senior leadership positions. And as we say today, he's leading and driving a change that is really important about leadership with impact, particularly in an African context. Vugani, welcome. And let's begin our conversation. Um, Dr. Mtombeni, thank you very much, <laughs> sir. <laughs> thank Excellent. you for inviting me to, to, to the uh, uh, Gibbs uh, uh, CEO forum. I appreciate the opportunity. Our distinct pleasure. So I, I want to begin in, in an unusual space because um, I remember in that conversation that you had with Leila Fari and Professor Mamukheti, as well as um, Martin Kingston, there was a lot of discussion about leadership and trust and a new kind of leadership that was required. And then when you look into the world of Accenture, they talk about being a responsible company amongst other things. And there's building blocks about what that means. And your organization locates being a responsible company in this notion of sustainable development goals. So against that background, I wonder if we can begin at home as opposed to outside of Accenture, within Accenture, for you to reflect, how do you live being a responsible company? How do these sustainable development goals evidence themselves to your peers, to your staff, to your customers? Well, thank you very much uh, for, for, like I said, hosting me, um, Morris, and, uh, and to start with such an important topic around, um, you know, sustainable development goals. We, we as a firm um, have signed ourselves up to really, take responsibility as, as a company, not just 
um, be there to earn profits. I think we, we all want to work for organizations with purpose. And purpose finds itself in us doing things that are really meaningful for humanity, you know? And this is why for us, you know, SDGs become one of those enablers to show ourselves up in terms of being a purposeful organization. You know, we, we, we really look forward to gender equality, for instance, our, our ambition here is to be a 50-50 um, gender split organization in 2025. So not far from now, you know, and, and this is not just in South Africa, by the way, this is a global ambition. You know, uh, Julie Sweet stands up on the podium. Uh, we, Julie Sweet is our, is our group CEO for Accenture globally. And she stands up on the podium and she speaks about this, you know. Here in South Africa, we're committing ourselves to the same. You know, we, we, we want to ensure that we, we, we foster sustainability, you know, not in the way that we, we, we help our clients to think about how to create sustainable cities, sustainable communities in spaces where we live. But most importantly, we, 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 we think about the world hunger in a different way in that we, 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 hunger is a decent, is a, I mean, is an issue of human decency. Now, I, I know you know this, Morris, but too many people go without food every night. And uh, we take this as a responsibility of ours as an organization to look into how can we create sustainability across the board, including dealing with and, and, and ensuring zero hunger amongst communities where we operate. Now, so, uh, Accenture operates in 120 countries globally. And this is the card that we, that we place up very high in terms of who we are, how we think about it. And then the last one I'll, I'll just touch on, uh, Morris, is, is this whole point of creating decent work and economic growth in countries where we operate. Because remember, this is so important for us because um, unless economies grow where we actually are operating, we know that our business isn't gonna grow. So we therefore place ourselves at the, on the front foot of ensuring that there's meaningful and sustainable economic growth and we participate in, dealing, in making sure that that's the case, but also in helping um, countries where we are operating to actually focus on building decent work. This is very important for us. And uh, um, you know, we are doing so many things around what I've just mentioned to you in, in, in economies where we are operating right now. Great, so you've touched on at least three SDGs that you're very engaged with. So you're talking about SDG five, which is about gender equality, SDG 10, which is about reduced inequalities, uh, SDG 8, which is about uh, uh, decent work and economic development, as well as uh, SDG 1 and 2, no poverty uh, and zero hunger. So it's really important. You've kind of given us a great agenda to begin with. But I wonder if you could maybe give us an insight, because a lot of the CEOs we speak about, they talk about how COVID has shaped them and reshaped them. And I wonder if you could just give us a glimpse quickly about how um, the COVID context has reframed or refreshed or helped you to reflect on your purpose as an organization. Before yeah. we go into the deeper issues around economic development, which is our go-to place as a business school. No, certainly. You know, uh, Morris, we, we've, we, uh, COVID has humbled us in many ways, you know, because when COVID hit, we, we knew that we, we, we had to deal with a very different and difficult beast, okay? But I don't think that we absolutely comprehended what that means, okay? 
Um, and that's evidenced by what we saw here in South Africa in July, where I believe that COVID significantly created a, a situation where we saw the unrest happening in Gauteng and, and KZN, for example. But let me just share with you a few sort of, um, you know, critical things that have helped us to, or have, have happened that sort of uh, made us think differently about who we are. Or maybe not think differently, but embolden who we really are as a business. One of the things that I'm super proud of as a company is that we, we really stepped back during this COVID and thought about our people. Um, um, very, very carefully. When, when I say about, and when I say our people, I'm not only talking about our staff. I'm talking about their families. I'm talking about their communities, spaces where they where they actually live, their loved ones, their helpers, the people that are around them. Uh, to say, how can we help um, as a responsible business? in ensuring that those families still continue to live and live a, a relatively healthy life under circumstances. Why, you know, you might ask, but why do we think like this? You know, uh, our viewpoint is organizations don't operate in a vacuum. They, they operate in a space where people live, especially now where we are doing work from home um, you, we want to be sure that families and the people that sustain those people who do business for us and for our clients are taken care of as well, M not only just our own people. So we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about the, 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 the people that work for us and the extended family, uh, families that work for those people or that actually interact with those families. So that's one big part. The second big part has had to be the impact that we as a company can make in actually helping South Africa and Africa to, to, to alleviate the COVID-19 sketch. And, and the point there is around um, how can we assist in, re in rebuilding the economy? Because we know that we will only get out of this problem of uh, the economic slump if we deal with the COVID situation and do so head on. So many people don't know that we've donated significant amounts of money as a company um, to uh, various NGOs in the country to deal with vaccine procurement and to also deal with the issue of vaccine hesitancy. You know, which which I think is a is probably going to be one of our main of our main issues, you know, as we move forward, because there is a, a significant problem of, of vaccine hesitancy. So solidarity has been one of those where we spend we, uh, where we invested quite a significant amount of money. And we've also spent some money in organizations such as Oram Institute, which is focusing on helping with the vaccine hesitancy. And then the last component, um, uh, Maurice, has been around how we're helping the organizations who are actually our clients. You know, we, we, when, we, when we had the situation in July um, uh, with in KZN and Gauteng and with the looting, many, many, many of our clients were really under pain because They've had their shops looted and all of this stuff. And we said as an organization, but let's step back. Let's figure out how we can help those organizations actually rebuild. Why? Because at the end of the day, they are our clients. They are our, our backbone of success. So without really asking for them to pay for any of our services, we volunteered our services to assist. So I guess the point that I'm just trying to, to, to put forward to you is that uh, COVID has, has said to us, we need to step back. We need to think better or differently about our people, about the spaces where, where we live, and about those clients that we serve. Thank you. So, as, as Sindri Pillay says that 
one of the ways you also contribute to sustainability is through your supply chains, where you ensure your partners uh, and uh, align with Accenture's strategy. Can you unpack that? Because you know it's it's quite something else to talk at a philosophical level. It's another to kind of understand practically what does this mean. So how do you work with your partners to ensure they align with your strategy and what practically does that do in generating development and growth in the in the economies in which you operate? Yeah, uh, certainly. I mean, look, I, I'll quote. Uh, three. It's not just by by the way on the on the partners, i.e. suppliers to Accenture, it's also our clients. So let, let me give you an example, practical example. So we've signed ourselves to say we wanna to contribute to zero emissions by 2030, okay? So we, we therefore say, when we talk to our clients in the energy space, in the mining space, we say to them, how can we help you to reduce the emissions that you create, Mr. Escom, the uh, emissions that you are dealing with, that, that, that you, that you, you know, uh, mining houses actually contribute towards in our country so that we, we could actually reduce the emissions. So it's not just, um, you know, words, but it's actually working with our clients to actually put, to, put together strategies so we could reduce it. And then on the other side is actually our suppliers. Okay, so for instance, we work with the hyperscalers, as you know, we, but we're saying hyperscalers who are building cloud um, uh, facilities in the country, how do they themselves contribute in reducing uh, emissions? How can we, for instance, move towards the green economy with our own partners in terms of ensuring that we we actually reduce emissions. So I'm just giving you one example of where practically we actually join forces with the people in the ecosystem to say, actually, how do we work with them? May, it may be energy, it may be in the energy space, for instance, or in the, in the, in the product space where we work with car manufacturers, we challenge them on the, on the same thing. You know, so it, it's, I mean, the center is right. We, we actually, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word force, we we, <laughs> we 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 partner effectively with the with the people you that strongly are nudge. You strongly, strongly nudge. nudge. That's the right <laughs> way. <laughs> it's a business nudge. school. <laughs> and, and then also show them the show them the way. You know how to do it. How do we think about it? And where where can we actually get you know work together, produce research papers, and actually put together strategies and enable it so that it's actually. A practical in a way, uh, Morris. So as we start moving to maybe a more South Africa-centric conversation, or an Africa-centric conversation, let me quote from a tweet, I think it was earlier this year in January, uh, by your CEO, Julie Sweet, who says, sustainability is the new digital. Our mm -hmm. research said, companies who embrace both technology and sustainability are two and a half times more likely to be tomorrow's leaders. So clearly, kind of people, there are some people who think of kind of sustainability as a cost, um, whereas others see it as a source of innovation. Correct. I infer from this tweet that uh, at Accenture, it is a source of innovation. Do you want to unpack that? Am I right? I'm on the wrong track here. Where do no. I sit? <laughs> you, uh, you know. Um, we're very clear on this, uh, Morris, that sustainability is not a negotiable, okay? Uh, unlike some presidents in other countries who say actually sustainability or, uh, is, is just phantom, we, we really do believe that unless we as a people in various leadership roles we're in, actually take meaningful steps in driving the sustainability and, and actually coming up with practical solu solutions. We see it as an opportunity of, to innovate more than anything else, uh, Morris. And, and you know, we, we have become very strong on this as a company. Uh, like I shared, you, you, I mean, you read Julie's uh, tweet. This is one of her personal ambitions to see us as a company 
actually fostering innovation in sustainability in the meaningful way. Just to give you a sense of what we have done, we have now appointed uh, uh, Peter, Peter Lacey, who is our global sustainability director. He's based out of London, and his job is to drive sustainability across the world. So I now have uh, appointed my own um, 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 sustainability person here in the country who works with Peter to bring sustainability solutions in South Africa. So, so that it's not just us coming up with ideas in South Africa, but we use the global organization to bring sustainability ideas in the, in the country. So that's kind of how seriously we take it. Lovely. So I suppose sustainability triggers different conversations in different parts of the world. In the global north, the, the most pressing one is this notion of climate action. Um, yes. And whereas in, in the global south, it's still about work and inequality and poverty. So in that context, I suppose talking about the agenda of the global south, you, you are have positioned yourself as somebody who's targeting this notion of youth unemployment. Now, I think if you wish, you can spend a few seconds problematizing, but let's spend the bulk of our time solutioning in this space. And I'd like to invite people on the call also to join us in the conversation about how do we solution around this youth unemployment problem that we have in our context. Well, well, Maurice, uh, uh, you, you've given me the opportunity to problematize, so I will uh, for, for a minute or so. But this is a crisis for our nation. We, we sit with 34% unemployment. 64% of that is youth, okay? And I was mentioning to you before everyone joined here that I come from the township, so Ekaya is Emlazi. Uh, I come from Emlazi here in Durban. And, you know, yesterday I drove through the township. And it's really saddening to see what I, what I see, because I talk about this topic all the time, and I've, not, I've now become so observant about it. You know, you drive through the township, you see young people in the street corners, you know, sitting there during the day, drinking alcohol on a Monday, at 12, okay? You may wonder what I, what I was doing there at Monday at 12, because I should be working, but I'm on PTO, so. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't joining that. But the, po the point is this, the point is, we as a nation need to do something substantial here. I mean, we cannot afford that the majority of our people, two thirds of our young people who are seeking employment simply cannot find jobs. And uh, we have in this country, very young, bright minds. We have significant amount of talent, as you know. I mean, you're in a business school after all, you see young people every day. We have um, the infrastructure next to none by comparison in Africa. We have uh, everything going for us. We speak good English or relatively good English. My children argue that I don't speak good English, but <laughs> <laughs> they correct me all the time, Maurice. But anyway, the reality is this. We have all that we need, I believe, as a country to deal with the unemployment sketch, but we aren't. And the question is, why not? What do we need to do now to actually bring to, to bring decent jobs to our people and do so at pace, because if we don't, we sit with a ticking time bomb that's going to create what we saw in July to be a norm in this country. And I think that be, that's a very, very dangerous situation that we could possibly get into unless we solve it. Thank you so much. So, so oftentimes when we talk numbers, we're talking percentages. You know, I remember my former, my former boss, uh, uh, GT Ferreira says, you can't buy bread and milk with percentages. You buy it with real numbers, you know, where there's a few zeros next to it. So when you're talking about like 64% of the 34% being unemployed, 
we're talking millions of people. And I think and maybe that's really important to kind of put that in context. We're not talking hundreds of thousands. We're talking millions of people and, and, and that are unemployed, that are discouraged. And I think it's really important that we put that in that context, right? And so no, with no. that image, you want to say something? I, I, I was going to say, to be actually, to be precise, the number of people who are looking for jobs in this country, young people who can't get it, is 12 million. Yeah. 12 million South Africans. Now, um, you know, I, I say out of those 12 million people, the majority of them, my view, can actually be placed on really meaningful work. And uh, that, that's the part that I'm very, very passionate about, uh, Maurice, which I think you know, if we put our heads together and we do meaningful stuff, we, we stop, you know, marveling at the problem and looking at it as this nice grandstanding thing over there and saying, but what are we going to do practically as, a, as, a, as companies, as a nation, as a people to fix the issue? That's what I think we should deal with. So on that, so let's pick up where Mahatma Gandhi uh, encouraged us to be the change that we want to see in the world. Um, so with that logic in mind, um, you have said there's a 12 million people problem. I personally, as Vugani, I'm going to take a portion of that and make it my problem. Right? So can I ask you, what is your number? Is it two people? Is it 10 people? Is it 100 people? What problem are you targeting the number that you want to fix in that 12 million problem? Before I speak to the number, because you're now asking me numbers which I have not uh, calculated, but I'll, I'll share with you the vision. The, the vision, Maurice, is this. I think the majority of what we as a company can help South Africa with is to deal with building skills of the future. When I talk about skills of the future, I'm, I'm talking about skills that we are going to require as the world to sustain our economies, okay? And uh, I, I think our company in particular is, going, is, is very well placed in helping shape the skills of the future in this nation. For instance, uh, skills such as cloud computing which we know we're going to require because everyone, there is no industry today, including yours, that does not require cloud computing. We are on this platform right now, which is running on a cloud, which is a cloud-based platform. This tool that we're using is sitting on some server, Lord knows where in the world. And some engineer, some technician, some person with great skills built this thing, put it on some, on some cloud infrastructure somewhere. And today is helping us to break communication barriers that we otherwise would be significantly challenged with. This is what we require for the future. I mean, yesterday I was talking to one of our, of our clients who is, of course, I mean, there is no CEO I speak to today that does not want to put their business on a cloud environment. So that's one. The second one is data. Okay, so you, you, you realize that data is the new currency. Maybe Judy says it's sustainability, but I say it's data. And if you, if you have data that you can mine and create value out of, you can actually understand Morris much better. Then we know what to sell to Morris. Then we know how to cure Morris illnesses and all these good things that we can produce out of the data that um, uh, is, is the next future skill. Um, there is so many of these. Artificial intelligence, for instance. So I'm saying our company is going to focus on helping South Africa to build skills of the future. So I'm going to stick, I, keep you there from a numbers point of view because I, I, you do have a number. You did whisper <laughs> it to me. I'm going to give I, you a clue. It starts with a five <laughs> with <laughs> lots of zeros after it. So I'm going to force you back to that number, then we'll circle back to the, the vision. No, no, <laughs> sure. So, so I, I, I think this nation is going to require millions of these skills. 
Okay, we're gonna require millions of people who have this type of capabilities to help us catapult forward. And I want to build in the next five years, at least 50,000 of these skills in this country, which we can utilize for ourselves and for the globe. So now for me, that is really powerful and, and really important because um, we, the challenge we have, so I think if I were to dichotomize and problematize, as, you, as we all know, we are very good on the one hand in strategizing and policy making. Yes. Then we're very good on the other in solving problems at a micro level, right? Two or three. So we don't have uh, scale opportunities. And so when you're talking about 50,000, that is scale, right? And then it means that when you achieve that 50,000, we can talk about the next 500,000 and then the next 5 million and so forth, right? So in, in that context, help us to understand, and I'm gonna lean here into a question from Tebukho Maulusi, who says, um, who wants to understand, given your access to national leadership, right? What ideas are you feeding into the system to solve these issues that we face? Let's get specific. So get specific about the 50,000, where is this gonna come from? Who are you partnering with? Who do you need to partner with to bring this vision alive? I like it, Maurice, because now we're making practical. You know, I, I always say we build nice policies, nice uh, strategies, and we put them on a shelf and nobody else does anything about it. So we can't do that anymore. So, so here's the issue that we face. I told you 50,000. You think that's, that number is big? It's nothing. We need to build skills in the millions. Why do we need to build skills in the millions? Number one, we have 12 million youngsters who should be on jobs and they are not. So we've got to solve for that problem now, okay? So to solve for it, we, we should build skills of the future in our young people today, okay? We should teach them to program, we should teach them to be engineers, we should teach them to be all these good things. And, you know, when we were talking on the conversation that you referred to with Mamu Kheti um, a, a couple of weeks back, we were actually talking about what she's doing practically as the University of Cape Town, for instance, to actually take youngsters who are today sitting in the townships, put them on the UCT high school, then put them on programs in the university, and then they get into employment with the right skills which this, with, which this country needs. So this is a practical solution. The, now, just to go back onto my trail of thought, we need millions of people. We need some of those people for ourselves to service South Africa. But I think the vision, the grander vision is even bigger than that. It is really about how can we, ex how can we be the net exporter of skills as South Africa and send those skills to other nations? in the same way that like India does it today, yeah? I mean, I look at various nations, India, the Philippines, Eastern Europe, uh, China, and these countries have mastered the art of building the right skills. They are able to use those skills for their nations, but most importantly, they send those skills to us. I, as the CEO of Accenture in South Africa today, we, Accenture use a whole bunch of skills coming out of India, for example. And you ask the question, why can't we do the same? Okay, so for me, the grand vision is to actually build skills sufficient for us to have enough capacity as a nation and also to, to build skills such that we can export those skills to, to, to other nations. You ask, what are we therefore doing in practical terms to actually deliver this? Number one, I believe that efforts by individual companies is great, but it's just not good enough. Why? When you do something small at home, Maurice, you build, you, 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 in your backyard, you, you make a small garden of vegetables. And I have my own small garden of vegetables behind my, back, behind my house in the backyard. 
the combination of those will just not be enough to sustain the world hunger. But imagine if the two of us joined forces and we went and plowed the field out there and actually create a much bigger, um, you know, um, hectares and hectares of vegetables that you can sell to markets to deal with world hunger. I'm using this analogy to, just to give you a sense of what I'm thinking about. I think corporate South Africa, civil society, government should come together, okay? And ask, but what problems do we need to solve to create scale for South Africa? I dream of a country where we have delivery centers in the same way as what India has. I mean, if you drive down uh, Bangalore, um, you see buildings upon building. Accenture has, I, I once drove down the street and there's 10 buildings with the same name, Accenture, all of them occupied by us with thousands of Indians working for Accenture in one country. And I dream of the same thing where we can create an opportunity to create delivery centers at scale that services South Africa, but also services the world. How realistic is this dream given our poor educational outcomes from a basic education perspective in terms of numeracy, uh, uh, skills, communication skills, for example. You know, I, I ask this because we talk about this concept of skills of the future as if it's something that's still happening, still to come, but actually it's a misnomer because they are the skills of the current, of the present, and how the present is reshaping into becoming increasingly and decidedly more digital. So we're talking about skills of a digital world, really, yes. and yes. which requires numeracy, communication, problem solving, discipline, etc. How realistic is that vision given our lived experience as a people in this country? Well, I, Maurice, you are right. We cannot deny the fact that we need to do more and better in creating a, 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 a skill base that at least at the foundational level is strong enough to be skilled further. Let me use those words, okay? But at the same time, my, uh, uh, my view is that we do have a, a reasonable skill base in the country, which can be reshaped. Let me just give you an anecdotal example to give you a sense. Two years ago, I signed up with Codex in Cape Town and we took 25 youngsters who just finished high school. Codex teaches youngsters to be able to learn to code in Java, okay? We trained these 25 people, 20 graduated, and all of them work for Accenture today. Okay, now I, 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 what I'm sharing with you is, is probably, it, doesn't, it won't answer the question, your question in full, but it's gonna give you a sense that partially we can do something. We cannot throw our hands in the air and say there's nothing we can do because we do not have a great foundational background. I think, um, there is some elements of truth in that, but it's not entirely true because we still have great minds, great young stars who still have a relatively good, they may not be the best, but they're relatively good and they could, they could be used. The second part where I think we have a serious impact to make uh, more is, is in the area of, of global business services. In other words, outsourcing, okay? I read an article in, in April, which was written by the president, where he said, South Africa was named number one destination of choice for global business services. Why? Because of the infrastructure, English language, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but when you look at who today occupies the significant market base in global business services, South Africa is ranked number eight. Okay, in terms of the practical sense of where people are actually buying GPS. Why? Because you look at the enablers for success in this area. What do we need? We need, um, uh, we need to, be, to have uh, tax uh, incentives for companies to use GPS. We don't have those 
or when we don't do enough, we need to have technology zones, special economic zones, blah, blah, blah. We are not doing enough in these categories of activities that we need to, as a nation, do to be able to do global business services. And that's why I said to you to be practical. We need business to come together, including my competition. I mean, I should work with my competitors because we're no longer competing here. We are solving a national crisis. We need to come together with our competition. We need to come together with, with government and, and we need to come together with civil society to solve the issue. So I'm sorry, I've, there's quite a few other calls, but I'm going to go back to Tebuko because it's still appropriate to this conversation that we're having here. Uh, yeah. Where Tebuko says, uh, it seems like countries like India, China, and the US and Europe. Um, so Tebuko, India, China, and the US are countries. Europe is not a country. But anyway, have built a competitive advantage in digital skills like coding, AI, machine learning, and big data. The cost per capita is to build that skill and offer it to the global market is much lower. So does the strategy of going the same direction make sense? They will ask. Uh -huh. Knowing how South Africa learns, SA learners, my earlier question, struggle with maths and science. And then they will ask, should we not be looking at agriculture, creative industries, strategic sectors? I suppose this is an important question to kind of reflect on. And, and maybe if you don't mind, you could kind of think about how India, so it's not India, how China, for example, thought of their problem way back when, talking about 30, 40 years ago, and how they today are leaders in digital. So they arrived today as leaders in digital, but they entered it in a different direction. So are you suggesting in your vision, we go straight to the AI and machine learning, or are you suggesting there's an African way of arriving there if you take a, a medium to long-term view? I think the route to digital transformation doesn't go through agriculture. I think also we haven't got an option to not build skills in the digital transformation arena. We just simply don't. Why? Because the world is going digital. Uh, well, actually, to your point, Maurice, it's not going. We are living in a digital era. Now, for us to say that we are going to let other nations be the custodian of digital skills, and we are simply going to build other skills that not, do not necessar necessarily land themselves in the space of digital transformation. I think we would be taking a wrong route. I also say that to Tebuho's point, it's not that we should not build other skills. I'm, I'm by no, um, no means advocating that the skills that we require as a nation in other industries should not be built, no. That's, that also would be wrong, but I'm just saying where I see my company, which is Accenture, being placed you know, with other companies similar to us who require these skills, who see the, the future of South Africa being enabled significantly by digital and, innovate, in, and innovative technologies. We simply don't have a choice but to build them here. You know, um, some of you might have seen, and I'm looking for it here, um, an article yesterday um, that was published on my broadband that, for example, our Department of Justice has been hacked. Huh? They've taken all of their backup. So just stop for a second and think. And they're demanding a ransom of 33 million rand. That's one context, right? And then we know that from a cyber crime point of view, Globally, there's a 5 million skills shortage. Right? So even if you were to kind of focus on one, cyber crime, and yeah. feed 5 million jobs, because digital is in many spaces, but I'm just choosing one, right? Um, uh, the kind of problems that we are experiencing where we are being hacked would be very, we would be better prepared. Because I don't think our government departments are prepared for the cyber security risk that we are all living in globally. Right? So I, I fully agree that the, clearly we need other skills, but these ones are more urgent at this point, and there is something that we can do about it. I suppose in that context, uh, maybe from a skills point of view, relying on Rima Singh, is what skill support structures does Accenture have in place for graduates, right? particularly in this 
skills of the future domain? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. By the way, I graduated from university and went straight to Accenture. So <laughs> I, I, I am what I am because of the firm. But let me just answer directly in this way. We have built, um, so we do a number of things. Number one, we hire, we recruit graduates. We take plus minus 200 graduates per year and place them on our graduate recruitment program. And we skill them up in various technologies. But these are people who came from university, top tier university in the country, you know, and very smart, bright young people that you put into this program. And they generally just excel at, at it. So that's one part, which is about graduate recruitment. The second one is what I mentioned, which is the next tier of, tech, of, 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 of folks who are once again, significantly smart, bright, young South Africans, who we put into programs that, uh, that will enable them to become something. Now I mentioned Codex as one example. This is where we take high school graduates just with metric and put them on a Codex program and two years later, they, they come out on the other end as great Java programmers. We do lots of this, okay? So we, we call them skills to succeed program, which we take, we take our own money, we put into the NGOs. Uh, um, um, the one that I've mentioned now uh, is an NGO, for instance, there are many more. And then the last one is one that we've just launched now. This is. Uh, we, is part of our skills to succeed, which is focused on building, uh, let's say, cloud-based skills for various technologies. You know, we've, we've just put in 200 people in our skills to succeed program, which is about building, engine, building engineers or cloud engineers who will help us to take us forward. We're gonna do the same thing on cybersecurity um, pretty soon, which is, uh, you know, 200 people just in cybersecurity. To your point, uh, Maurice, this is a big area. I mean, we are being hit. I mean, there's no client that's not worried about cybersecurity right now, given the advent of change. I must say, if you ever receive an email from somebody claiming to be Morrison to have been asking for money, know that I've been hacked. It's been happening quite a lot. So I'm not <laughs> asking for money from anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, um, so, so on that, for me, is, is, is really talking about how uh, organizations are evolving. And I was on another webinar um, with a, a, some, a former, actually, Accenture partner from Asia who lives in Singapore. And, and, and uh, she explained that in her region, Two things. One, they're actually not looking for, which is not good for our story, by the way. <laughs> they're not looking necessarily for graduates or business school graduates, because some business schools in their region are not generating the kind of required skill sets. Right? Right. But at the same time, they're very suspicious of people like you and I, Vugani, people that don't change jobs. <laughs> right? <laughs> because they're saying we just are stuck. All right. So then anyone who's got more than 10 years in a job in Asia at Accenture, they're very suspicious of that person. Right? They want right. people that are changing jobs. So it, it got me thinking about how does Accenture in Africa then think about, uh, you've already, oh, I'm just building on this portion, problem of talking about we, this thing of the skilled people from a university, but there's also capable people that haven't been given opportunity. How do you guys think about the, the talent pool on the African continent, and it, it, does it reflect what your former colleague from Asia was talking about, or are there different dynamics within an African context? I think there are very different dynamics in the African continent. Um, um, uh, well, but I'll talk specifically about South Africa because I know South Africa well, uh, as opposed to other other countries. The reality here, um, um, Maurice, and that's why I think there's, the dynamic is different. We have a very limited pool of graduates from universities uh, in any given year. Even, I, I think, you know, they don't even make um, a, a significant percentage of the employed workforce 
today, you know, in terms of uh, the, the majority of the people that we have, which we should tap into and we are not, is the, is the folks that are able to complete metric and then get stuck because they either did not, they, they, they do not have uh, sufficient funding to go to the next steps or they go to, um, to the colleges in, the, in their surrounding areas and they graduate, sometimes even graduate with university degrees and then stay at home, okay? So for me, this is the group that we should really check. This is about, you know, it's a question of human decency, uh, Maurice. You know, there is no child that wants to go to school work so hard, graduate from university only to languish at home, yeah? You, you know, you and I were lucky enough that we graduated and we got jobs in various places. I got job in one place and, <laughs> and we, we've been successful in our careers. Imagine if we were in the shoes of, young, of those youngsters. And this is why I, I think we have to focus so much on identifying the pool of talent that we could potentially unleash. And the, you know, I always say that when youngsters come to Accenture, okay, we actually don't know their potential. You only know their potential when you unleash them on jobs and say, wow, these people are such bright young minds. And you, know, you otherwise wouldn't have known that unless they are on the jobs doing something. And this is what I want to see for our own country, that we can actually take the majority of these people, put them through training program, put them through delivery centers, and then galvanize the supply to make use of them so they can really hone, hone in their talents and become great at what they do. So part of the challenge we have in our country, maybe I'm gonna do a little bit of talking here, is when we think about skills, we think about what you and I have been through, which is a cognitive-based skills development and academically-based skills development. What right. you are talking about is a competency-based way. It's, right. it's about doing micro skills and then scaling up all of those micro skills and then maybe eventually having some kind of an accreditation. But the focus is not on the accreditation. The focus is on these on-the-job, very hands-on, and so for me, part of the opportunity is for us to change the definition. So when we use the word engineer, in, I think in the minds of many South Africans, engineer means somebody with an engineering degree, right? Whereas actually in the global context, particularly in your world, engineer means something else. Can you right. explain to us, I saw you, you caught on to that, when you use the word engineer, what do you mean? Yeah, no, no, you're right. Let me just say this. What do we at the end of the day buy? Me as, the, as Accenture, I buy someone who has some capability to either program, okay? So they can code. Whether they went to university or not, or they were taught by Codex, I actually quite frankly don't care, okay? Yeah. Can the person code in Java? And the answer is yes, I would put the person on a Java project. Now, when I talk about engineer, I'm talking about someone who can configure a cloud-based infrastructure for me and my client in order for us to have this conversation on Zoom. Now, this person may never have seen the door of the university, but they, have, they may have been taught by some institute or by Gibbs or by uh, UCT or University of Johannesburg or whatever the case may be by some NGO, the ability to sit with a PC and configure that we can actually have this conversation through Zoom. How do they learn? They figure, they go through the, like you said, someone will, will do a basic course in Microsoft Cloud, Microsoft Azure, basics that says, this is what it means. Then they will go to intermediate. Now they figure out which pods to open. They figure out what, what how to actually configure. Then they become, experts though they do an expert program which gives them even more skills and more depth this is a very specific engineering course that teaches someone how to make use of azure platform to actually enable you know the ability for us to 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 communicate via microsoft teams as an example the point is 
the, the people we need in this country are people that can do something and something worth buying in the, in the digital skills world or in any other industry for that matter. Does that need to go through university? Maybe yes, maybe not. Lovely. So there's a question here, which I'd be interested from Daunyane Ramajue. Yeah, my Sisutu came and saved me. I didn't slaughter the name. Um, who is really concerned about this focus and digital and the impact on the rural and, and as a, as the rural communities. And as I was reading that question, I quickly went online and discovered that there's a district in Limpopo called Vembe District. This district produces like the, the best metric pass rates. Um, and specific schools in that district uh, stand out. Schools like Mbilui Secondary, Chivase Secondary, and Tengwe Secondary. These stand out for producing, amongst others, some of the brightest mind. And these are rural schools. In fact, Mbilui finished their metric uh, syllabus in May <laughs> during lockdown. And what they're focusing on now is kind of preparing, they've been preparing because they decided we're gonna go to school Monday to Saturday. Uh -huh. right. uh, because we don't know when this lockdown and they did not want to be disrupted. So my sense is there's a presumption that digital is only for the urban and not for the rural. What do you say to that? I, I, I absolutely think that's, um, that's, um... That's incorrect, uh, if I may be polite, uh, Morris. And the reason for it being incorrect is because, I don't know about you, but I'm a rural guy. I grew up, with, I mentioned Umlazi, but I only arrived there when I was an adult. My entire schooling life, I did so in a rural school. Ngapa, Etopo, High Flats to be precise. I don't know if anybody on the call knows this, but I grew up in a rural area. When I first went to university, there was one English professor who spoke with British accent. I couldn't understand what the hell the guy said. And eventually <laughs> I called one more to see and asked her to sit next to me and said, explain <laughs> to me what this guy is saying. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is the truth. And the majority of us came from rural areas, but look at where we are today. And I think that um, the smart people don't come from urban areas only. They come from across the country. Like you rightfully say, Professor Marala, who uh, graduated at uh, NBE in the uh, Bembe district. This is the guy who has the best accolades in computer engineering and AI in the country. The point Same is- Same as the CEO of Lufuno, the, C the CEO of CSIR from the same area, same school. So this is the point, yeah. This, this is the point. And we should actually, uh, the consumers of this, of this same digital economy we talk about is not someone sitting in, a, in the cities only. I mean, if you think about who buys online and you look at the, at the, at the, the map in the country, it's everyone, including those who sit in the, in the outskirts of the country. So we should never confine our thinking to only it being in, in the cities. Lovely. My mother, my parents live in Limpopo, Kapa Pazela, uh, yes. 10 kids from uh, Toyando and another 10 kids from Malamulela. And um, she buys on take a lot. Just, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> she buys on take a lot. So Mr. Tawanyan, I hope that that answers your question. Let me ask you to conclude your last co concluding comments. And here we're going to go to Togazani Twala, who says we're going to using the power of three. What are the three things we need to do as a country, nation to grow the economy? I'm gonna just stop it there. Perfect, this is, this is a great way of closing. I think we need to create trust in the system. Too many of our people don't trust that we have the, 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 their interest at heart. And as a result, we have created a group of people or a bunch of nationals who are disenfranchised, but most important, don't believe, okay? And the only way to create trust is to promise and live and live through the promise. So I think this is the first thing that we as a nation need to do. We break too many promises, and as a result, our people don't trust us anymore. 
Number two, we have got to invest in skills development in this country. We do not have an option, but we have to do so and do so at, at, the fast, at, at the fastest pace as possible. And then the last thing that I think we need to galvanize this thinking um, is to make sure that we focus on the enablers, okay? There are so many enablers that we've got to focus on. For instance, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that for corporates like our, like us, to, be, to invest our money and more and more of our funds, we need to have the right conditions in the country to make it work. For instance, we need to make sure that there's incentives that are, are being put in front of us by, by, the, by government. We need to create special economic zones that enable this type of, of logic to work. You know, we, we, got, we got to do uh, technology zones. We got to create um, um, uh, income tax breaks. The conditions that enable companies to invest more and more of their money and to come in numbers here in South Africa because we have created the conditions that enable us to actually um, uh, grow would be the best way to create economic activity. Vugani, thank you so much for playing with us and helping us to understand how as a people we can move from problematizing and towards solutioning and I believe that the kinds of conversations that you are having with in Accenture, the kinds of conversation you're having across the industry are demonstrating how we need to focus on scaling up. Some great comments from people like Christopher Thompson and others on the call about kind of shifting the mindset from being this very corporate mindset, but to kind of being a work mindset. And so we need to move from looking for jobs to doing work and doing work that is important and that is meaningful and that transforms society. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day further. Thanks, everybody. Thank Cheers. you so much, Boris. Thank you very much. Excellent.